You know, God never takes away anything without something to replace it. This is very important as we look at Ezekiel chapter 40. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And welcome to Bible Discovery TV as we study the Bible from Revelation to, or from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Very, very interesting. We're going to talk about Isaiah 40, or rather Ezekiel 40, in just five minutes' time. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey? We're going to be asking ourselves the question, what happened to all the temple furniture? Ryan? Well, Ezekiel makes a number of allusions to the Garden of Eden. So today we're going to search for that long lost Garden of God. And that is really important in these particular passages. Okay, Janice. Today I want to talk about a new life. All right, this is all coming your way. Take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have a Bible guide, stay there. We'll show you how you can get one. But the most important book of all is the Bible. Let's listen. Ezekiel 40, 1 through 9. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it, toward the south, was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears, and fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Now there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure one rod, and the height one rod. Then he went to the gateway which faced east, and he went up its stairs and measured the threshold of the gateway which was one rod wide, and the other threshold was one rod wide. Each gate chamber was one rod long and one rod wide. Between the gate chambers was a space of five cubits, and the threshold of the gateway by the vestibule of the inside gate was one rod. He also measured the vestibule of the inside gate, one rod. Then he measured the vestibule of the gateway, eight cubits, and the gate posts, two cubits. The vestibule of the gate was on the inside. Ezekiel chapter 40, verses 1 through 9. Ezekiel 40, 41 and 42, that's what we continue to read. These last chapters of Ezekiel are absolutely stunning. And as we go through the Bible, we are learning a lot. And Daniel's coming up next, but it's interesting. You know, the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10. Prophecy is a word from the Lord. And the word of God is truth. Now, that means that prophecy is not something that may happen. It's something that will happen. Prophecy is only mysterious because we lack the spiritual discernment to unveil its uh, true meaning or because God has purposely veiled it for our own good. But thankfully, hindsight is twenty twenty. When we explore the Bible, then we see that everything the Lord says does happen sooner or later. Now, that's what's going on here in Ezekiel chapter 40. There is a new city coming that will contain God's presence. We will see it no matter what we believe now. In that future, there are measurements and dimensions applied to it 
And that is the reason that Ezekiel is told to pay attention to all that he sees. The next eight chapters of Ezekiel are dedicated to explaining the Lord's temple and the land that surrounds it. These are some of the most mysterious pa passages in the Bible and in the scripture. They, they're absolutely amazing. And as we focus on this, we definitely need to pray because we're going to learn something about this passage and the Holy Spirit's going to teach you and me. And Father, I pray today as we focus on this, the new city. What, what is this, Lord? What's, what's happening here? Father, only your Holy Spirit can tell us. I mean, our minds can work and we can read, but your Holy Spirit speaks to us as we read. And so we give you surrender. Take us, Lord, and help us to understand what you're saying. That way we will we'll be ready to hear what you're trying to tell us. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, amen. So take your Bible guide and turn to the page. If you don't have one, write to us or call us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on it. It'll take you to a page where you can download it exactly how we printed it. Okay. What in the world are we reading? We're reading about the last eight chapters of the word of God. Ezekiel chapter 40, verse one says, in the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th day or the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it towards the south was something like the structures of a city. He took me there and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand. And he stood in the gateway and the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you for you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. This is something, let me tell you, God never takes away something without replacing it. What do I mean by that? Well, listen carefully. When we give our sins to follow God, the Lord replaces those sins with his work and his ways. You know, a lot of people talk about coming to the Lord. And they talk about, I gave up this, I gave up that, I can't do this and I can't do that. But let me tell you something. When I came to the Lord, I not only gave those up, but I gained a vast amount of insight power from the Holy Spirit and adjustment of my mind to the thinking of God. It was and is amazing. I gained a whole lot more than I gave up. And that's something that we need to hear. That's something that we need to stress with each other. And Ezekiel sees this and he's just coming by the river Chebar. He's down there, but God opens his mind and says, I want you to see what's really happening. So that's interesting, isn't it? All right. Let's go on and read more about this. Ezekiel chapter 40, verse five, one verse here. Now there was a wall and all around the outside of the temple. The, in the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure, one rod and one, and one height, one rod. Now, this is interesting because God provides specific measurements to the wall of the temple. Now, beloved, we may not understand the measurements of the temple because we are confined to time. A prophecy is outside of time. Let me see if I can explain this. It would be like if you were two dimensional and you could see this way and this way, but you had no ability to see depth. And one day you were two dimensional. One day a person came to you who is three dimensional and looked at you. You couldn't see him, but he got down into your depth and suddenly you could see him. He put his finger down and you would see a circle. That's all you'd see because you're just seeing the finger, slice of the finger. 
You see, beloved, that's how prophecy is. Prophecy explains and exposes all the dimensions of God to us and tries to communicate that in scripture. It does a good job. We can only define that by the power of the Holy Spirit, something we should always remember. Now let's go back to the scripture. Six through nine, chapter 40. Then he went to the gateway, which faced east, and he went up its stairs and measured the threshold of the gateway, which was on, which was one rod wide, and the other threshold was one rod wide. Each gate chamber was one rod long and one rod wide. Between the gate chambers and, the, and was a space of five cubits and a threshold of a gateway by the vestibule of inside the gate was one rod. He also measured the vestibule of the inside gate, one rod. Then he measured the vestibule of the gateway, eight cubits, and the gate post, two cubits. The vestibule of the gate was on the inside. Beloved, listen carefully. God has shown us the structure of the temple which exists inside and outside of our space and time. Now, you're going to take your mind a little bit to wrap around that, but as Christians, our minds are not limited to space and time. What? What are you talking about, Rod? I'm talking about we are open now. The Holy Spirit has opened us to the dimensions that God exists in. And it's so far beyond our own belief. Now, this is very hard for many people to understand, but the Holy Spirit will help us. The Holy Spirit will keep us. Stay in God's word. Focus on that and ask the Holy Spirit before you read the Bible to help you understand it from his perspective, not from our perspective. Very, very important. So let's keep that in our hearts and very close to us today as we continue reading the book of Ezekiel. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. All right, so it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today, my segment is about the Garden of Eden. Why? Well, because Ezekiel makes a number of allusions to the Garden of Eden, both to the original garden and as well to the future garden. But today, I want to do something a little bit different. I thought it would be really interesting to try and locate this long-lost paradise. Now, there are a lot of different theories and ideas regarding its location, but is this a hopeless pursuit? Well, let's do some digging. For a great many years, man has searched high and low for the ancient Garden of Eden. And while numerous theories abound, its precise location remains elusive. It causes one to wonder if this Garden of God will ever be found. Interestingly, the biblical, geological, and geographical evidence all seem to suggest that this original garden is truly forever lost. As many theologians and biblical creationists have pointed out, the Genesis flood of Noah's day, which was nothing less than global in extent, completely devastated and rearranged the topography of the earth. So Eden, wherever it was, is probably buried under kilometers of sediment. In addition, Genesis describes a river flowing out of Eden, which divided into four individual rivers. Yet there is no place on earth today that has this unique geological feature not even in Mesopotamia, where many believe Eden lies. Even the Bible itself seems to indicate that Eden was buried. In Ezekiel 31, 18, God says to Egypt, To which of the trees in Eden will you then be likened in glory and greatness? You shall be brought down with the trees of Eden to the depths of the earth. Although it seems likely that the Garden of Eden won't be excavated by archaeologists anytime soon, if we tease out all the geographical clues possible from Genesis 2, we can arrive at a rough model for Eden. For example, since the single river coming out of Eden breaks up into four rivers, we know that Eden must be higher than the surrounding region, perhaps much higher. This may be one of the reasons why many scholars think that Eden was located atop a mountain. 
Another reason might be that Ezekiel 28, which is full of Edenic imagery, refers several times to the mountain of God. It also makes sense of Isaiah's Edenic allusions, which identify the future Eden with the mountain of God, which is Mount Zion. Furthermore, as Lita Sanders and Robert Carter point out, a mountain location would also explain how there was apparently only one entrance to Eden that needed to be guarded. All other routes could have been impassable due to the steepness of the terrain at other points. Significantly, we see this garden mountain theme outside of the Bible as well. In fact, this fits the later Babylonian, Median, Persian understanding of a garden paradise. For example, the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon were apparently modeled after the mountainous region of Media. Additionally, early religious buildings from Mesopotamian ziggurats to Egyptian and Mesoamerican pyramids share a mountain-like shape. The idea that the gods were associated with high mountains is almost universal in ancient cultures, to the point where mountains were considered holy places, and ancient people even constructed artificial mountains as places of worship. Even though Eden is now lost, and we can only speculate about what it was like, thankfully God has promised to one day restore this perfect garden paradise for those who love him. So even though the original Garden of Eden is gone, as you saw, we can sort of scripturally reconstruct what it may have been like. The whole idea of Eden being atop a mountain is really, really interesting and consistent with the language that Ezekiel uses, and even in Isaiah, in their Edenic allusions. And the mountain garden theme is also consistent with extra-biblical evidence as well. Of course, the coming Eden, Mount Zion, is what we believers should really be excited about. God will indeed restore everything back to its perfect Edenic state. And to that I say, praise God. You know, we, we need to remember that uh, this all, the Eden took place and was created for Adam and Eve as the perfect dwelling place. It was the place where the tree of life was. And, uh, it, it, you know, God took it away when we sinned, but it's very interesting because we don't look to that anymore. We just look to, uh, you know, well, we can do this and that. We've got a bucket list and we got to do this before we die. But with eternal life with Jesus Christ, we don't have to because mm -hmm. God's given us eternal life. We need to keep that in mind. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> very interesting. Okay, Corey. All right. Well, as you know, Ezekiel 40 to 42 kind of dissects this new temple idea. So, so I want to look at the first temple, the temple that was destroyed and the articles that lived in it. So the furniture and, and the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant, all these good things and see if we can track whatever happened to them and where they ended up. Take a look. Until its final destruction by Rome in AD 70, the temple in Jerusalem had been a key component of Judaism since the days of Moses. In Moses' time, the temple's predecessor was built and called the Tent Tabernacle. This tent and its precious metal-covered utensils and artifacts made it without much drama through the time period of Moses and almost all the way through the time period of the Judges. The Bible and archaeology then team up to show that the city of Shiloh, which had become its permanent residence, was destroyed destroyed by the Philistines during the life of Samuel. That the tent and some, if not all, of its articles survived is implied in 1 Kings 8 at the dedication of the new permanent temple in Jerusalem built by King Solomon. He had the tent and its furnishings brought into the temple with a great celebration. Though the tent artifacts and the new temple artifacts commissioned by Solomon now had a permanent home, they weren't safe from the ravages of politics and war. A few times in Jerusalem's history, her kings raided the temple when they were strapped for cash and needed to pay off enemy kings. This left a temple and articles that weren't in their full glory by the time of the final Babylonian invasion of Jerusalem in 586 BC. But the riches were still enticing enough for the Babylonians to take them back home home with them as spoils of war. Less than a hundred years later, Babylon itself would fall to the Persian Empire, who released the Jerusalem exiles with the temple articles. A more humble temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem and the articles reinstated. Between the Old and New Testaments of the Bible, another assault on the temple was carried out by Antiochus Epiphanes. His efforts were short-lived and rooted by the Maccabean revolt that managed to salvage many of the temple treasures. After a 
massive temple renovation project spearheaded by Herod the Great, the temple once again became known for its majesty, short-lived as it was. Rome quelched the great Jewish revolt by ultimately destroying the temple and taking its furnishings to Rome, the most iconic of which were displayed in the Roman Temple of Peace, paying homage this time to the majesty of the empire. So there we go. On tomorrow's program, we're going to take a look at the menorah or the menorahs, the lampstands that were a part of the temple and see what we can learn about those historically. But this just adds a little bit of information for you, a little bit of a trail of, you know, where how far we can track it till the trail goes cold. Yeah, it's very interesting. In these last eight chapters of Ezekiel, uh, you know, this is a very uh, mystical part of the scripture. Mysterious, yes. And, 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 you know, because there's a lot of people who tried to figure it out and explain it theologically and everything else. Yeah, there's argumentation over it. There's different mm -hmm. positions that people take over how we should understand this. Somebody asked me recently, uh, we have a Tuesday night, uh, sort of a seminary meeting, and somebody asked me, is that temple the temple of the millennium? Is that temple? And it's really interesting to hear how the people have different ideas yeah. behind the temple. And I find that fascinating. We're going to study that in the coming couple of days. Okay, Janice. Well, I'm going to take a look at it in a different way. So uh, Ezekiel chapter 40 really talks about a new city and a new temple. We've heard from Corey's about the original temple. Now there's so much description given and all of the different rooms, you know, we see here the Eastern Gateway, the outer court, the northern gateway, the southern gateway, gateways of the inner court. Then we have a section where the sacrifices were prepared, the chambers for singers and priests, dimensions of the inner court and the vestibule. There's so much just even in this one chapter 40. And what struck me was that this new city and new temple is also like we are in Christ Jesus, we are a new creation through him and we are the temple of God because he dwells within us. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And first Corinthians six, verse 19 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. And did you hear that? When you commit to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not your own anymore. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You give your life, all of your decisions, everything that you do, you give it to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you become a new creation. Does it mean that all of a sudden one day, Janice accepts the Lord and she's brand new. My spirit is alive, but it is a lifetime of learning how to follow God, learning to let go of my own ideas and get God's ideas and God's thoughts in my life so that my actions and reactions become more about Him and less about me. We need to give God access to every part of who we are. That's what it means to follow the Lord Jesus. I think that's amazing because there's so many people, um, you know, on television and on the internet who are developing their own ideas mm -hmm. and saying, well, that's because of this and that's because of that and that's because of this and I believe this and everybody who follows me, you know, and the congregation of their ideas and their belief systems are all fragmented on the internet. And God tells us, I want to tell you something. There are many people in the world and many Christians in the world, and they have different ideas, but they all serve me. And so you have to realize that God, it's not about your own idea developing. It's about what you said, submitting yourself to God and allowing him to present to you what his idea is. And I find that fascinating, especially today with the internet and all of that going on. So that's really good. Well, all of our studies, you know, when we, we come to prepare for this program, um, we, we, may, we each have a different angle from which we, you know, the, the things that interest us. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it comes down to the authority mm -hmm. in the word of God. 
Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And different perspectives are a really good thing because they, they challenge us to, to question maybe ideas that we have in our own self that, that need to be questioned. And they, 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 like I, we need to grow and work together as people. If we are all the same person, it would be yeah. it, it, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. Right? That's, uh-huh. that's the concept. There. Yeah. So yeah. we need differing ideas and different perspectives and we need to not lose the ability to have civil conversations with one another. Yeah, it can be passionate, but we need to be able to have civil conversations. And, and that's, that's what the family of God needs to so look like. Allegories. There needs to be diversity, but unity within that. But unity. Allegories are not God because mm-hmm. allegories tell you I'm going to give you what you want mm. on the internet. And so it's important to remember that the algorithms. Oh, you mean and algorithms. Algorithms, gotcha. yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Algorithms, yes. And all of that, because we need to remember mm-hmm. that God is challenging us with how we see things. Yes. And that's good. Mm-hmm. It's good to be challenged. It's good to see a couple of different points of view and ask the Lord, look, where is this at? And understand it, because that's important. And I, you know where I learned that? The Chinese church, the church under a great deal of persecution. That's where I learned that years ago. And it's very important that we pray for the persecuted church because they, they're very wise in many ways in which we are not over here in the West. You know, it's interesting as we think about this and we pray, it's hard for us to grasp everything that prophecy includes, but yet Ezekiel is telling us and God wants us to know that. So let's pray together. Lord, even though I don't understand it all, I do today want to praise your name for showing us. Help us, Lord, to realize that time is also a dimension and there will come a time when we will understand everything we're reading. In Jesus' name, amen.